the engines of corporatism uh, cannot be halted. Uh, they are impervious to the will of uh, those who they exploit. Uh, they are more powerful than the governments they control. Uh, and they have built within them an inevitable kind of mechanism for self-annihilation because corporations uh, have this strange pathology where it, they turn everything into a commodity. Uh, human beings become commodities, the natural world becomes a commodity, and you exploit these commodities until exhaustion or collapse. And that's precisely what's happening. A question that at least runs through my work pretty constantly is, is what is our threshold to recognize the death spiral? Or what is our threshold to recognize that we don't live in a functioning democracy? These corporate entities are impervious to the will of the citizenry. Uh, they have carried out a coup d'etat. Uh, they have won, we have lost. We live in a culture that is so utterly awash in lies and propaganda as to create a kind of collective hypnosis or self-delusion where you have people through the manipulation of fear and permanent war and self-glorification, in essence, clamoring for their own enslavement. And that's extremely difficult to overcome. Yes, I think we can be contaminated by violence, but I, I think the truth is that we're also already pretty contaminated by the violence that we see around us, and we're contaminated by not responding, and we're contaminated by, by being made into slaves and by allowing this to continue. We're contaminated by the situation. All resistance finally begins with a reorientation of how we relate to the world. If you look at history, the, it, it wasn't just like capitalism did not e evolve because somebody one day said, I've got a great idea. Why don't you all leave your homes and families where you're working for yourselves in this, this pretty you know, organic and decent way and come over here. I've put up a factory. You can build it. I'll keep it. I'll keep most of the money. You'll starve. I'll dominate you. And people are like, yay. You know, uh, <clears throat> they didn't do it like that. There was definitely coercion. There was also a slow seduction over many hundreds of years, okay? Uh, the Marxists call it primitive accumulation. I think it's a good name. It, it isn't over yet. It's always happening, and it's not just happening in, in Chiapas, where that's what the Zapatistas are fighting, or in Oaxaca, where that's what they're fighting, or, or in Megalea, or in Philippines, and all these places. It's happening here, too because it, it redoubles itself, right? So like the, with, with media, with virtual ways of incorporating us, the, the state form and capital seep into our bodies and our lives and our being and our spirits. And that's how they, those things have been so successful. They permeate us and they break into relations so that, you know, if I, I've, got, uh, I've got some fruit and you've got some garlic, you know, it would be ideal, and you need, we need what we have, I'd trade you some fruit for some garlic, but, you know, it, it doesn't occur to either of us because we both go to the supermarket, so capital's got us. And if I want to talk to you about something, I'm upset with you. Um, best thing to do would be for me to talk with you, but I don't really trust you, and whatever deal we make, I don't believe in. I want a hard and fast contract backed up by a state and backed up by police so that if you don't do what you said you would do, then I get someone to come and arrest you, take your stuff. So. That happened over a long period of time in the places where it's advanced to the state it has. Us, I'll quote Gustav Landauer, we destroy the state, we destroy capital, um, which are states of relations by means of the permanent lasting um, other relations that we build. So ultimately, <laughs> and this is a thing I wouldn't have said before, I mean, that is the revolution, okay? That is the revolution.
in moral terms, what are the people who who are the people who run BP or Exxon Mobil? Um, they're uh, they're executioners. Uh, they're killers, uh, not only of the human species, but of the very ecosystem that sustains life on the planet. Uh, in moral terms, they purport they propagate systems of death, uh, quite literally. Uh, and unchecked, they will kill us. They'll kill most of us, along with all the other innocent life forms that had nothing to do with the folly of human existence. One of the things I think is also very important is for us to explicitly acknowledge that war has already been declared. And yeah, there was a coup, and that those in power are waging war on the planet. And we need to start thinking about this in terms of war. You know, one can go back to the, the, the great Christian anarchists like Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, um, who understood that essentially severing themselves from the society. I mean, Dorothy Day wouldn't pay taxes. Uh, they, she didn't own anything. This isn't the end of resistance. This is the beginning of resistance. That I think that this particular culture of consumption, this culture built around fossil fuels works because we give these corporations a lot of money. Uh, Lauren Berlant writes, quote, the attempt to associate democracy with austerity, a state of liquidity being dried out the way wine dries out a tongue, is fundamentally anti-democratic, end quote. Well, I agree, and so I'm puzzled by why, even after September 2008, after, in a sense, neoliberalism, after certainly the end of the Washington consensus that organize the world's affairs for two decades or perhaps three decades after globalization, or at least after all three of these were exposed as something other than simply the way things are, I'm puzzled by why after 2008 we seem to have no after to globalization or neoliberalism, but more of the same. We probably are now in uh, a crisis that began in 2007 uh, and uh, really took a nosedive in 2008 uh, when a number of Wall Street banks went under. Uh, we probably are in the fourth great crisis of capitalism's history. Uh, the first one was what was known as the first Great Depression of the last quarter of the 19th century. The second was the 1930s, the Great Depression of the 1930s. The third was very important to my formation, the crisis of the 1970s. In the world today, the oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon. They will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. If the Arab countries keep that pledge, it would reduce their production by almost 50% in one year. And we've now, it seems, entered the fourth uh, great crisis, which might be called the first Great Depression of the 21st century. If you want to see the economic downturn's impact on average Americans, look no further than Sacramento, California. The city's homeless rate is growing at an alarming rate as people who just a few months ago had decent jobs suddenly find themselves with no place to go. Here's NBC's Chris Jansing. This is Sacramento in 2009, but take another look. These images, so hauntingly reminiscent of the iconic photos of the 1930s and the Great Depression. This is a modern day shantytown along the railroad tracks for Sacramento's exploding homeless population. This is the bottom of the barrel here. This is, the, I don't think I can get any worse than this. Jim's new home, a small tent with six layers of tarp to keep out the rain. For 30 years he worked construction, then six months ago, the jobs dried up. I'm used to having a roof over my head, electricity, uh, my own bathroom, uh, a TV to watch news. 
I wasn't even in my wildest dreams to end up in a place like this. There are 2,000 homeless in Sacramento. 300 live here, with more coming every day. Um, I normally go to anywhere from two to five construction establishments or businesses a week, and I'm told the same thing every time I go to each one of them, that we're not hiring. Many of the stories here are heartbreakingly similar. Middle-class Americans living paycheck to paycheck lose their job, then their house, and have nowhere to go. Every shelter in Sacramento is filled to overflowing. It's happening in Seattle, too. Tent cities in Reno and Nashville. Sudden homelessness brought on by unexpected, shocking poverty. Uh, it began very notably and interestingly in the housing finance sector. Uh, and uh, that was a product of the extent to which working people since the crisis of the 70s had become dependent on debt in order to sustain their standards of living, especially in the United States. And the rest of the world needed them to sustain their standards of living in the United States because the United States was the consumer of last resort. It was the basis upon which Japanese companies were able to still make profits even after the Japanese downturn in the 90s by selling to Americans. It was the basis for Chinese capitalist development over the last two decades. Uh, so American workers whose uh, incomes uh, stayed stable or even went down from the 1980s on, and that was part of the resolution of the crisis, the previous crisis. The previous crisis was resolved by breaking the militancy of trade unions, uh, by ensuring that uh, workers worked longer and harder and more people in each family worked and worked at much more casual and precarious jobs, right? But working class consumption didn't go down through credit cards and above all through treating the one asset they really own, which is their family home, as both their retirement savings, uh, assuming that housing prices would continue to go up, or what they would get hand on to their children, or as a basis for taking second mortgages and consuming on the basis of the borrowing they did on what presumably their houses would yield when they were eventually sold. Uh, they became increasingly indebted. And the banks were falling over themselves and promoted by the American government and other governments to lend money uh, to working class people and to lend money to more and more layers of working class people who never really had been part of the American dream especially black communities. The way in which finance is linked uh, in a very complex way means that when that large sector began to tank as the housing bubble burst uh, in 2006, as it inevitably would as soon as the Federal Reserve raised interest, interest rates in the, in the middle part of the decade, uh, you uh, got the makings of this financial crisis, which then had a knock-on effect uh, in the rest of the economy. So that's the bind that capitalism's in, and it's a, it's a big one, it's a deep one. Uh, it it uh, is nothing new. Uh, part of the making of capitalist globalization has entailed a constant series of financial crises. Uh, what's been remarkable to this point is that the American state, together with the other G7 countries, have been very active in managing and containing those crises so that they didn't, you know, uh, cascade around the world. They were unable to stop this one from cascading around the world. But we saw very quickly that uh, what a, you know, ideological myth it was to, to believe that the state had pulled out of markets, that markets don't depend on states. As soon as every one of these crises over the last 20 and more years occurred, states ran in to uh, provide liquidity to the banks who were tanking. Our most, urgent, our most urgent task upon taking office was to shore up the same banks that helped cause this crisis. It was not easy to do. And if there's one thing that has unified Democrats and Republicans and everybody in between, 
It's that we all hated the bank bailout. I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. I hated it. You hated it. It was about as popular as a root canal. Yes, it's a big challenge because what we've seen in the whole way capitalism operates, again, over this neoliberal period of the last 30 years, that is to say the period of just throwing everything into the market and cutting back everything else, what we've seen is that more and more social wealth is going into banking and financial institutions. They've become sort of the central operators and organizers of how the capitalist market economy works, and they've been siphoning off more and more wealth. And in the process, what that, that's meant is that financial institutions have come to exercise huge power over workers in a variety of ways. Either directly, we become more and more indebted through mortgage structures, credit cards, other kinds of borrowing uh, that keep us noses to the grindstone trying to pay the bills. But also, these financial institutions are often dominating large corporations, dictating their investment decisions, what factories close, which ones get new investment. And of course, what they basically do is they go for the low wage areas, the ones with the highest profits, the ones that are taming workers, keeping them under control. And so that is an enormous challenge because what it means is that Workers' organizations can't just think about how they relate to their individual employer. They have to think about the whole system and the structures of power within it. One of the big, big problems we've had in the recent financial crisis is that the banks were bailed out by governments, but nowhere were trade unions and workers' organizations effectively able to mobilize to say, no bailouts without full employment policies. No bailouts without a commitment to green job creation. No bailouts without real social commitments on behalf of where investment will go. And so what's happened is the bank just got it on their own terms. And so the challenge is going to be in a financialized capitalism for unions not just to respond to an individual employer, but to begin to actually articulate an alternative vision for how we use the productive resources of our society, how investment decisions are made, because these are coming from public funds. The public purse bailed out the banks. Why doesn't the public then get to say what they ought to do with all those funds? So I think that's a huge challenge, and it's one that if unions can't rise to, we're gonna find the same game that's being repeated and repeated. Uh, I mean, financialization in the very limited sense just refers to the way that uh, finance, financial capital takes on a, more and more of a hold over the capitalist economy. The way I use financialization is to understand it as a cultural and social process, which is the way finance infiltrates its way into everyday life in more and more profound and insidious ways. So for instance, the fact that we're all now in incredible debt, that we are, live our lives under the shadow of uh, credit, that uh, we increasingly are forced to imagine all parts of our lives as investments. So education is no longer a social good, it's an investment in the future. We have to understand all of our lives as sort of uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis. Now, America's biggest debt burden is now on the shoulders of people who have yet to even start a career. The money owed on student loans now outstrips the nation's credit card debt as the number one financial problem. And a surging unemployment rate of nearly 10% is only likely to worsen the situation. RT's Anastasia Cherkina has been to meet some of those badly hit by the crisis. A ticking time bomb of American debt. This time, all this is owed by college students. $3,000 adding on every second. <sighs> if I keep going at the rate that I went the first year, I'd... By the time I'm finished, I will have about $120,000 worth of debt, just from school loans. The most traditional financial baggage dragging behind for Americans has been credit card debt. For the first time, debt belonging to college students has taken over that number one spot. 
Students graduating in 2008, 2009, and 2010 are, are facing the worst job markets in a generation at least, and so you have people who have more debt than we've ever seen before and are having a harder time finding any job, let alone a job that pays them enough to somehow pay off all this debt. 29-year-old Shayna is haunted by major money problems. What she earns now is barely enough to survive on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone pay back for her education. The money that comes from the internship is, like I said, very little and doesn't pay for much. It'll pay for maybe a dinner or two. The connection between lack of a good enough, if any, job and growing debt has never been as tight for graduates. According to some reports at certain American universities, students have been borrowing 70% more money in the last year. The universities are actually cutting deals with the student loan companies and making money on the side. There's been a, a lawsuit in New York, a million dollar fine against Columbia University for steering people to expensive loans. The danger here is that instead of capitalism, we end up with serfdom because these students are kind of indebted for life. So financialization in a limited sense just refers to what's going on with the preponderance of speculative capital within uh, the, the general share of different types of capital in a capitalist economy. In a broader sense though, it has to do with the way finance is totally reorganizing our society. Uh, in an age where finance now, where major corporations own practically everything and those themselves are tied into the financial markets as never before. Well, I think primarily what financialization does is it changes our social notion of what's possible and what the future might hold. Because if our future is always colonized by finance, in the sense that we're always thinking about, we never have a chance to think about new social projects. We're just thinking about debt. We're constantly haunted by this sense that our future is already foreclosed by you know our personal levels of debt, by government levels of debt. You know, governments are constantly talking about just uh, paying down deficits, paying down debts. There's no broader social vision that's possible, uh, or very little social vision that's possible. And sort of the future, our individual futures and our social futures, really narrow to this sort of endless now of neoliberal, uh, neoliberal exploitation without end. Uh, I think in that circumstance, unfortunately, there's a number of very negative effects on how people imagine resistance. First of all, most people imagine resistance is completely futile, and that's partly just because of that existential experience of debt and financialization that means that uh, we, we have a hard time envisioning what the future might look like. Uh, I think, so that's, that's on the one side. On the other side, we have a general mass forgetting of past movements and how they got out of situations much like this. Um, but thirdly, I think there's another tendency which is even more worrisome in some senses, which is that when we have this sort of the future collapsing to this endless now, we get really bad forms of resistance that are very gestural and they're very much based in just trying to get a reaction out of the forces of the state. If different alternatives, different uh, visions that people may desire and develop do not fit into the market model, they are easily dismissed. The securitization uh, phenomenon also influences this, obviously. If uh, fear and uh, concerns for security of, of some kind become the main concern, they overrule every other criteria for decision making or for the development of political alternatives. So as a result of these kinds of influences, what you find is that there is no political space left for people to, on the one hand, criticize the existing order, to bring up issues of equality and justice, on the one hand, and or to develop alternatives to the existing order, on the other hand. So, uh, like if, if, if those kinds of decisions over the market priorities or of, over security predominate, then, then people find it more and more difficult to decide what it is they want in, for a better society. When thinking about crisis, especially in the Marxist and communist tradition, I think we have to first um, bracket off or, 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 or even reject a notion that's, that, that's been strong within these traditions that um, capital will collapse through its own crises. That in, that in a way, the, the, the end of capital and the coming of a new society will happen by, by capital's own self-destruction. This um, 
think of that as a collapse hypothesis. And I think that's importantly not true, that, that capital functions through breaking down, um, through continuous crises on different scales. Sometimes uh, those crises are just a way of functioning. Sometimes it can, it, can, it can in some ways weaken capital. In other times, it actually strengthens capital, the kinds of privatizations um, and strategies that follow that follow an economic and or natural crisis. So the crisis itself is not, is not really the issue, it seems to me. I think that we're, it's clearer if we would distinguish between what I would call subjective and objective crises. In other words, think of objective crisis as the notion of capital of its own accord um, collapsing. Of, of breaking down in the sense that 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 the capital will um, create its own downfall, and rather subjective crisis, which seems much more interesting, is recognizing the subject of capital's crises. So, for instance, um, uh, interpretations of of the um, stock market crash of 1929 and the subsequent Depression. If one, the common understanding of that, and even of the, um, and even of the New Deal up to the New Deal after that, the common understanding of that is capital of its own accord, um, creating the conditions for its downfall, and then, with the New Deal in the United States, um, reforming itself in a rational and enlightened way. You know, granting the 40-hour work week, granting the right to organize, et cetera. Well, the subjective reading of that crisis instead is about the power of organizing of the CIO and the other, uh, and, uh, and trade unions in the US, both organized and, and uh, labor collectives, that, um, less institutional, that they created the conditions both for the um, crisis of capital and the need to, for reform. So for instance, in this reading, the New Deal in the United States would not be about the enlightened rationality of capital. It's really about capital's response to the dangers that it experienced to uh, the power of organized labor. What I'm saying is yes, the first phase of the crisis is over, and the crisis is changing, or as I put it, mutating. It's changing form all the time. It began with a crisis in the US housing sector, it then moved into a new stage, which was a full-phased global bank collapse. So the financial crisis was the second one after the real estate housing crisis. Then it moved into a sovereign debt crisis. That is to say, having bailed out the banks, all kinds of governments had spent way beyond their means. This has been the big debate in Greece. You bail out your banks, ultimately the government was borrowing money from the financial markets to do that. Now the financial markets turn around and say, we don't think you're a good risk anymore. We're not going to keep lending, and so on. So this next phase we're moving into is a huge coordinated assault on social spending. They're going to try to cut back massively. i give you a few examples where the International Monetary Fund has come in. One third of all teachers in Latvia have been fired. 25% of the rest of the public sector is gone. Pensions have been slashed by 70% in Latvia. There's an organization in Britain which says that by 2017, the average worker in Britain will be $4,500 poorer than they are today as a result of cutbacks to social services and increased taxes to pay for the bank bailouts. So in other words, Banks collapsed, governments bailed them out, now they're coming to ordinary citizens, to working class people, to make them pay up for this. This is really what I'm trying to provide a full analysis of in Global Slump. But then the last part, as I say, is the politics of resistance. It's not like this is all inevitable. One serious study after another is saying, we're talking about at least a decade long process of what they're calling a decade of austerity. Some people are talking about a generation.
Lori. Peter, we're still days away from world leaders arriving here in Toronto, but the city, it seems, is already in lockdown. These days in downtown Toronto, police patrol in packs. They can be seen on practically every street corner, walking the beat, riding bicycles. We are setting up our mounted command post. They police from the saddle, on the water, and in unmarked vehicles. They are everywhere. Thousands of cops from different cities across Canada have converged on the downtown core. The federal government has spent about a billion dollars overall for security on the G8 summit in Huntsville and the G20 summit in Toronto, mainly to protect against terrorist threats. But according to the head of CSIS, who spoke to Peter Mansbridge earlier today, the main security concern is from protest groups. I think surprisingly little on the terrorism front. We don't think there is anyone who's really interested uh, in doing any harm uh, from that perspective. On the other hand, anarchist groups, uh, multi-issue extremists, yes there is, there's a fair bit. And some of those groups who were out protesting today already clashed with cops. Police may have backed off today, but the riot gear they carry, the steel fencing that surrounds several city streets, this old film studio that is now a makeshift jail, all suggest police aren't likely to back down when the summit starts. You're going to have to talk to the sergeant. Sorry, won't you talk to me? I'm sorry, miss. They're not talking to the media, and they're warning the public. All right, let's go through this time. Okay, but make sure you have your ID card, okay? They're stopping pedestrians, Thank you. drivers, and people who work in the so-called red zone. Work ID? How about a piece of work, work ID? Yeah. There we go. Julie Williams says it's a sight she didn't want to miss. It looks neat to me. Like, that's why I'm down here taking pictures. Why do you think it, what, what's the neat part of it for you? All the officers and their uniforms. <laughs> I'm the class, working class, always last. Equal opportunity, hypocrisy. I'm back against the wall. Another black youth about to fall. Delroy step in the dance, sell some weed. Misguided path to succeed. Delroy's head pounding, blues them resounding, bittersweet black like night exploding. A cold breeze passed through the door. It's the police, everyone freeze. Delroy brethren flee for them life, steel flash tons. 70,000 homeless, taken from the streets. I'm curious, and we're seeing uh, yesterday the, the head of CSIS, which is Canada's spy agency, was saying that one of the biggest threats that they see for this upcoming G20 is not from terrorists, but from anarchists, pointing the finger directly at them. And I'm wondering, what is driving the movement here that brings the anarchists to the G20? Well, um, first of all, it's rather surprising that they say that, because um, I can't think of anybody at a summit who's ever been harmed by an anarchist um, or any anarchist who's ever tried to harm anyone uh, taking part in a summit. So in a way this is all really scare tactics. And, and what, what, is the, what is the protest for, for the anarchists who will show up if they're not there to hurt people? What, what is the point of being there and what is the point, the attention they're trying to get uh, with their message? Well. I actually found it a little surprising in um, the lead to this that you said that anarchism isn't associated so much with direct democracy as with direct confrontation. Most anarchists think that's exactly what it's about. Um, these summit protests are actually experiments in direct democracy of de uh, decentralized consensus process. What we think of ourselves is creating the seeds of another world. Okay, so and w why then to take this to the doors of the G20? Well, the G20 for us represents everything that is bogus about the claims to democracy of the people who are not currently leading the world. Um, right? We think that 
we don't actually live in democratic societies. People are motivated by democratic ideals. People believe in democracy, but they're sold a bill of goods, basically. The society around them has n almost nothing to do with democracy. Um, there are certain values of liberty that everybody incorporates, um, but those values of liberty are really the soul of anarchism. Most people really accept anarchist values and don't understand that that's what they really like in the idea of democracy. And what we're trying to do is create a version, a model of how democracy could actually work without prisons, without police, without courts, uh, without oppression, without inequality, uh, and try to bring that into being. When you do that, you generally find yourself in confrontation with police, whether you seek it or not. against poverty, the global campaign for climate action wants to say is that this is the Canada we know. The Canada of Stephen Harper is not the Canada that the world wants to see. Yeah. Our message to the G20 is simple. If you could have found not millions, not billions, but trillions of dollars to bail out the banks the bankers and the bonuses, why can't you find a fraction of that money to bail out the workers, the climate, the poor, and the future of our children and grandchildren? Hi everyone, so my name is Leanna Salvador and I am just an ordinary student. I have $50,000 in student loans and I am just an ordinary student. I am just an ordinary racialized woman and by the time I have paid the interest on my student loans I will have paid twice as much for the same education as someone who could pay in full up front. And when the face of poverty is dominated by women and racialized people, education can and should be a social equalizer.
How can we begin to envision a better world when the same free market doctrine is continually being shoved down our throats in ballooning business programs? I am just an ordinary student who believes that education happens both inside and outside of the classroom. And today, class, welcome to Introduction to Democracy. And the best part is, this course is free. So make some noise if you believe that it's high time for this government to shift its priorities. Make some noise. So I just want to say, I say one billion for education, not for fortification. Let's show this government what we're asking for and let's educate them about how to put people first. Thank you very much. is basically, you want to play anarchist kids? Okay, go ahead, play anarchist, we'll ruin your life. 
That's the sense I get out of that. So they're basically, they've seen there's been so much activity in, in, in Ontario and in southern Ontario in the last while. And I think that's, that's, that's got dead power a bit worried. So to me, the, the G20 crackdown was kind of a, a cover for, I mean, I wouldn't say they, they held a G20 so they could attack organized <laughs> dissent. Um, but since they were having a G20, that it was an excellent opportunity to do more than just crack a few heads in downtown Toronto. They're trying to crack movements too, and, and, and to create a climate of fear. our own eyes or on video, peaceful protesters were attacked with rubber bullets, tear gas, pepper spray, and this is just one example at Queen's Park, riot police plowed into groups of people sitting on the grass, flailing their batons and kicking protesters to the ground. But the bottom line is that over 1,100 people were arrested, the largest mass arrest in Canadian history. The only one that ever came close was Clockwood Sound in the 90s, and that was an act of mass civil disobedience. That wasn't just rounding up people at random. Roughly 800 of those people were jailed, and from them we heard many reports of beatings, including beatings of people in handcuffs, of racist, sexist, and homophobic slurs and threats, of people being screamed at for speaking languages other than English, of strip searches of women by male officers, of groping by police, of sexual solicitation, of rape. We also heard about the shocking detention conditions, people crammed into very small cells, unable to lie down. We heard that medicines were denied, as was the right to counsel. I heard from women who were not given sanitary napkins, from others who were denied water and food for longer than a day. We owe a great debt of gratitude to the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and the National Union of Public and General Employees. Thank you. Because for the last few days, they have been holding hearings about all this, providing a much needed space for people to tell their stories at last, doing the job that our government will not do. And I've been a trade union activist for some 35 or 36 years. I've been to Seattle, I've been to Quebec City, I've been to Miami. I've witnessed many uh, demonstrations, protests, peaceful protests. I've also been involved in many, many labor disputes over the years. I wasn't prepared for what I heard from some 60-odd witnesses or persons that came forward and testified before us just recently in Toronto. I was absolutely shocked um, these people, some five months after the event, we're talking about 17-year-olds, uh, young men, young women. We're talking about people in their 60s and 70s. We're talking about people that just came out to observe. In, indeed, in a couple of cases, they were shopping in the area. And the violence that was perpetrated on them by the police is, un un is unconscionable. This idea of allowing the state to criminalize dissent in any modern democracracy, it, 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 it's really, it, it, it signals the death of that very democracy, if it's allowed to continue. So we came to Toronto with three specific goals. To make sure the global recovery is strong and durable, to continue reforming the financial system, and to address the range of global issues that affect our prosperity and security. We agreed to balance the need for continued growth in the short term and fiscal sustainability in the medium term. In the United States, I've set a goal of cutting our deficit in half by 2013. A number of our European partners are making difficult decisions, but we must recognize that our fiscal health tomorrow will rest in no small measure on our ability to create jobs and growth today.
simple definition is governments have budgets and they have revenues and they have expenditures and if the expenditures exceed the revenues they run off deficits and a series of more than one year of deficit runs into debt and the question is where did it come from and what would you do about it an austerity is a right-wing view of what to do about these deficits and debts so what it means to them is to cut essentially spending on social welfare programs there are many other things that you could do there are many things you could do better to get rid of the debt the deficit but they've chosen to do it because it's part of, part of class warfare in fact in Canada Stats Can did a study years ago of where the debt came from that the 95 liberals got into power and, be, and fought that debt and they concluded that 94 percent of the debt did not come from spending on welfare programs 50 percent of it came from tax cuts and 44 percent came from high interest rates and yet the liberals the liberals not the conservatives decided to attack the deficit with austerity and so they cut program spending which is health education welfare housing to 50-year lows and the conservatives have continued that process the great danger of course is if harper wins a majority will get english style cuts austerity to the budget which will make it even worse even though the Canadian debt isn't very bad at all, actually. And as I said earlier, there are many, many better ways of fighting the debt than cutting funding for housing, welfare, unemployment, etc. What was, inter what was interesting is that many of the people were talking about that Keynesianism was backed and Keynesian, you know, like even the ruling class members were now all Keynes and disciples of Keynes. What they didn't understand is that the capitalist system and the state and the state and the capitalist society will do anything to preserve the integrity of the system. So if it means that they have to engage in saving capitalist firms, if it means that they have to pump money um, into society that will allow consumption to maintain itself at a certain level so, so as not to destroy the system, they will do it. It's not a commitment to any socialistic um, policies or any Keynesian type of policy. They will do whatever it takes. But That's what they want to do is to weaken and discipline the working class all, all across North America, we can see the attack on teachers' unions. We can see the attack on organized workers telling us we need to um, reduce our excessive demands that are causing economic um, difficulties in society. That has nothing to do with wages, but it's a way to discipline us so that when economic, um, not economic, economic upturn takes place, we will be so weakened that we will give away anything just to preserve these alienated jobs. The exactly. unfortunate thing is that labor, organized labor, is not you know, defining things from a class perspective. They're still slavishly hanging on to Keynesian ideas about us increased spending during our economic recession so that we can have overall economic vitality without realizing that it's not about economic vitality, it's about the discipline, disciplining of um, the working class. It seems to mean that this provides an excuse uh, to go after the rights of working people, particularly in public service. Uh, and it provides a framework in which a lot of Western governments have been trying to uh, dismantle public service. And I think the, 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 uh, or public service jobs and, and the public service kind of mentality. And I think the motivations of doing that are pretty obvious. There are a few ideological true believers on the right who actually think that will make things better but I don't think there's very many I think it's a mostly a fairly cynical belief that the union movement has been more powerful in North America within the public sector and that's a way to weaken unions and therefore to weaken a voice for uh, alternative economic approaches uh, I think also that uh, there are some cost savings associated with it, but I don't think they're really driven by cost savings. You see the right time and again will advocate things like uh, public-private partnerships that actually cost taxpayers more, but it puts that money into the pockets of their ideological friends. So, I mean, I think the thing, the, one of the biggest problems from the right's perspective is that, that unionized workers and public sector workers have acted on a break on their really extreme plans for our society. So Say that again, they're looking for ways to defund the left. So, so they're, they're looking for ways to make our voice less effective. So. Well, we're entering, um, you know, it, it's interesting, in the months leading up to the G20, um, and in particular among the Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, that is English-speaking countries, um, there was a lot of talk of uh, pain and 10 years of pain. And uh, that was too much for people. So then they started to talk about 10 years of austerity. And what they mean by austerity pretty much, uh, in a nutshell, and I, I'm 
not being cliched here, is having workers, and in particular the public sector, and worker, workers, 97% of us who have to depend on public services, who can't afford to uh, you know, order our books from Amazon.com or uh, you know, go, go to a private health clinic, uh, drive a car, take a taxi, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, pay for the crisis by two things, by really uh, weakening the public sector, and uh, that includes wage freezes, contracting out, privatization, things like that and also uh, cutting public services. And really, I, I think the broad thing is with the idea of pain is to get the public to expect less, to kind of uh, take away this sense that's, this nascent sense of social solidarity that uh, working people might have in their communities and uh, replace it, or I, I wouldn't so much say replace it, but really in, reinforce this sense of the atomized individual. The, the, the limits are in, in two kinds. One is an economic limit. At a certain point, people will go bankrupt. And the financial crisis is sort of represent, representation of that. But ultimately, the real, the real limit to this is to the extent to which working people will resist this. To what extent will they, to use an old phrase, again, reduce the value of labor power? And if you're willing to work for less wages, and if you're willing to pay more and more debt, what is the bottom to being actually paying off this debt? And that's an interesting question. We don't know. I mean, people will begin to work for lower and lower wages and pay many more of the money out of debt. And one of the prospects is that the, the bottom to this is hard to discover. And so it really always, at the end of the day, Lenin has a phrase, something along the lines that there's no crisis that capitalists can't get out of if the working class is willing to pay for it. And that's part of what we're seeing. The United States, they seem to be, you know, there's a book called What's the Matter with Kansas, where he describes working class people who are completely in support of cutting capital gains taxes. As long as in exchange for that they can get some cultural advantages. They're opposed to abortion. They, are, um, they want in, uh, intelligent design taught in schools. And they are indifferent. In fact, they're more than indifferent. They're actually supporting tax cuts for the rich and deregulation. They have, in some, for some reason, which is hard to explain, actually identified with their exploiters. Well, you know, I would say that if, for example, in Toronto, there are com 13 communities that are seen as at-risk um, communities. And even before the onset of the Great Recession in 2007, 2008, these communities were expressing, were experiencing depression-like situation. You have, uh, you have unemployment of 40% among young people, even higher level of unemployment than what exists among the general um, population. In terms of um, access to schooling, you have these communities where children are getting, have to use um, the you know, breakfast facility just to eat. And some people are saying, oh yeah, you know, children are poor, children are hungry, as if these children don't have adults in their life, that if children are hungry, then the adults are also um, hungry. You have people using food banks, working people, you know, members of the working class, just to um, get by. So when an economic recession comes about, Condition is going to be much harder for them. There is hardship in society. Racialized people, and especially racialized working class, the Aboriginal working class, will experience a higher level of um, economic social stress than the other members of society. And it's for that reason why it is necessary for us to keep on fighting for universal um, social programs. Because but at the end of the day, and if you look at um, what was going on, for example, in the United States with the Great Recession and look at who were losing their homes, all across the major cities, it was racialized people, Hispanics, Africans, and also poor whites, who were losing their homes to these predatory home loan schemes that were concocted by ruling class elements in the financial um, industry. A day of protests in Europe, countries that are members of the European Union, home to 500 million people. The unions there are hosting strikes and protests against their government's handling of the economy. In Barcelona, violence broke out as protesters supporting the general strike against the government spending cuts called objects and barriers at riot police. They also burned a police vehicle in the center of the city.
El Mundo newspaper reports, though, that demonstrators involved in the clashes were not union members, but part of an anti-establishment group also protesting the government's belt-tightening measures. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of people marched through Brussels. The unions across the EU say the government's measures will slow economic recovery and punish the poor. Marchers representing 50 unions that include German coal miners, Romanian gas workers, and Polish shipbuilders headed for the EU's headquarters, waving union flags and carrying banners. Trade unions said they had called rallies in 13 capitals from Lisbon to Helsinki. And in Athens, transport workers were just some of the workers on strike shouting against reforms that they say have reduced their incomes, caused job losses, and increased taxes. Workers have been striking and protesting in Greece since March, when the government announced a series of cost-cutting measures to reduce the country's debt. And thousands took to the streets in Warsaw, demanding better wages and job protection measures. Workers' unions protested against the Polish government's attempts to raise the retirement age and a slower-than-expected minimal wage growth. The face-off in a square in the Greek capital had followed a march by tens of thousands of people. A general strike had also brought normal life in the country to a virtual standstill, with flights grounded, public transportation shut, and state hospitals left with emergency staff only. Even news broadcasts were suspended. People were furious about spending cuts and tax hikes intended to tackle the Greek debt crisis. Olga Raptu vowed the battle against the package would continue. Um, well, of course, capitalism is, is really built up on, on, on crisis. And uh, essentially, you know, the, I mean, this has been you know, talked about and written about in so many different forums. It has all these in, inherent contradictions. So with, with neoliberalism, basically, uh, there, that puts more pressure on the Greek state to lay off uh, public sector employees, which you know have more who have more secure jobs, uh, to shift towards a more uh, precarious economy, more short-term contracts, um, and also for for public sector work to be kind of shopped out to uh, private contractors who will then hire uh, immigrant uh, workers, usually without without any um, any stable contract, and and that certainly. Uh, adds to the list, list of grievances against capitalism, but it's you know it's by no means uh, the only thing wrong with capitalism. So even even before you know the more recent neoliberal phase of capitalism, uh, that that's just you know new new insults and new forms of exploitation piled on top of the old ones. Uh, and in fact, Greece has been operating within a politics of crisis for a long time. So I don't think there's really a mechanical explanation for the rebellion, um, in that uh, there there wasn't really a, a, a an acute deepening of the crisis right before uh, December 2008, but this was definitely one of the many issues that people could speak to, and that they and that they addressed uh, with the insurrection, with the, with the, the big rebellion that uh, that came out of that. This is an ugly battle, and neither side looks ready to back down. Athenians might have hoped for a sleepy Sunday. Instead, they got this. It's now almost 24 hours since this violence began in the city centre. At the moment, it seems that the riot police are succeeding in holding a group of anarchists and extremists back from the central police station. As you can see, the air is absolutely thick with tear gas. Some people came to demonstrate peacefully, to show how upset they are that the police had killed a teenage boy. We do not... The violence had raged through the previous night. It began here, in the notorious neighborhood of Exahia. This not the first time these streets have seen pitched battles between police and anarchists. But it's rare for the fighting to spread across the city center with so much destruction.
Protests must and should take place. Citizens have every right to defend their ideas and principles. But let me stress, not by destroying people's property. Um, so even though it was something that initially focused on the police and on police violence, and something which in a lot of ways the media tried to portray as a youthful rebellion, it, it immediately became something much broader than that. That all sorts of other people who had uh, problems with the police, such as immigrants, uh, came out to the streets, and that also they went well beyond the police to, um, to, to, to attack the entire capitalist system, the capitalist system as a whole, and the very ideas of capitalism, understanding that uh, that the police are there to protect capitalism, that this increase in precarity is also going to correspond with an increase in police violence, because the poorer people are and the more uh, exploited and, and bossed around people are, the more the state needs the police to, to, to use violence against them, to keep people in their places, to, to um, kind of, you know, stomp people down. Uh, the fight must be constant until the stability pact, these unpopular measures passed by the government, is overturned. And not all police were battling protesters. Some were holding demonstrations of their own. Police, fire brigade, and Coast Guard officers aren't allowed to strike, but they can and did rally. Coast Guard Lieutenant Jorgos Dirvako said the austerity measures hit them all hard in the pocket. You know, this was meant to be the first post-ideological generation, right? This was meant to be the generation that never thought of anything bigger than our Facebook profiles and our TV screens. This was meant to be the generation where the only thing that Saturday night meant was X Factor. I think now that claim is quite ridiculous. I think now that claim is quite preposterous. I think now we've shown... Now we've shown that we are as ideological as ever before. Now we've shown that solidarity and comradeship and all those things that used to be associated with students are as relevant now as they've ever been. You know, the, the, the most incredible thing that, that happened on Wednesday, I went down, I thought I was going to go down in lunch break and then get back in time for lessons. When, when, I, when I was kettled in there, I, I was with thousands and thousands of school students who'd come down with their ties around their heads in their school uniforms, and yeah, they were cold who'd come down, who'd never been on a protest before, who'd never joined a political party or been involved in a political movement before, who didn't have any economic knowledge or political degrees, but they were there because they believed in something. They were there because they believed in something bigger, and they were there because they knew that either 
You know, there weren't a million choices. There were two choices. Either they laid down and took whatever the government threw at them, or they stood up and fought back. And so those school students who'd never been involved in anything before stood up and they fought back. And when they were in that kettle, being kettled in by police, you know, the word went round as we were sitting, huddling around fires, sharing out what little food we had, and the word went round, people said, we know what they're up to. We know that they don't think we're a danger to the public. I'm 15 years old, people there were as young as 13. We know they don't think we're going to run riot through the streets of London. We know what they're up to. They think that if they kettle us now, we're not going to come on a demonstration ever again. Well, let the word go out from today, people said. Let the word go out about next Tuesday. Let the word go out about next week and next month and next year that they can't stop us demonstrating. They can't stop us fighting back. And however much they try to imprison us in the streets of London, those are our streets and we will always be there to demonstrate. to announce to Mr. Tom Morello! teacher in Illinois for almost 30 years and even though our family didn't have much money we always had enough food on the table and clothes on our backs because my mom was a union high school teacher so this fight for me is very very personal it is my belief that the future of the rights of working people in this country will not be decided in Congress it will not be decided in the courts it will not be decided on talk radio it will not be decided on Fox News. That the future of the rights of working people in this country will be decided on the streets of Madison, Wisconsin. You're making history here, and the whole world is watching. Alright, so for, put your fists up in solidarity, everybody, front to back. And we're in this together, brothers and sisters. It, it, it should not be in any way surprising that we are seeing right-wing ideologues across the country using economic crisis as a pretext to, to really wage a kind of a final battle in a 50-year war against trade unions, where we've seen membership in trade unions drop precipitously. Uh, and, and public sector unions are, are, are the last labor stronghold, and, and they're going after it. Uh, and they, these governors did not run elections promising to do these radical actions, but they are using the pretext of crisis to do things that they couldn't get elected promising to do. And then, you know that's that's the core ar argument of the of, of uh, and the, the thesis of the book is not that there's something wrong with responding to a crisis decisively. Uh, crises d demand decisive responses. The issue is this backhanded attempt to use a crisis to centralize power, to subvert democracy, to avoid public debate. To say we have no time for democracy it's just too messy it doesn't matter what you want we have no choice we just have to ram it through and we're seeing this in 16 states i mean it's impossible to keep track of it it's happening on such a huge scale teachers unions are getting the worst of it yesterday was international women's day this is um, you know as as you pointed out in your show it's overwhelmingly women who are 
providing the services that are under attack. It's not just labor that's under attack. It's the services that the labor is providing that's under attack. It's health care. It's education. It, it's those fundamental caregiving services across the country, which could be profitable if they were privatized. CJ in Wisconsin, Canada, and Mississippi. We switch out to LA, to the fields of Mission Flats. There's a thundercloud exploding, and I'm free at last. Watch your head, these are shot at 40 million times. Like our brothers, our sisters, up and down that picket line. Like the unnamed and unnumbered who struggle brave and long. Like the union men and women standing up and standing strong. Like the unnamed and unnumbered who struggle brave and long. Like the union men and women standing up and standing strong. We're seeing these mass protests in Madison, Wisconsin, and there's other uh, protests that are happening. We see the working poor, the middle class, under tremendous stress, and yet they're the ones who are being hit hardest, not Wall Street. Explain what has happened. Why isn't Wall Street in jail? Well, it's an incredible story. I mean, just to back up, you know, provide some context, I think, for this Wisconsin thing, and especially for the Ohio thing, given what their governor used to do for a living. Explain. Uh, well, he was an employee for Lehman Brothers, uh, and he was— This is Governor Kasich. Governor Kasich, yeah, and he was intimately involved with um, selling, uh, getting the state of Ohio's pension fund uh, to invest in Lehman Brothers and buy mortgage-backed securities. and. Of course, they lost all that money, um, and this broadly was really what the mortgage bubble and the financial crisis was was all about. It was essentially a gigantic criminal fraud scheme, where all the banks were uh, taking mismarked mortgage-backed securities, very, very dangerous, toxic subprime loans. They were chopping them up and then packaging them as AAA-rated investments, and then selling them to state pension funds, to insurance companies, to Chinese banks, and Dutch banks and Icelandic banks, and of course these things were blowing up, uh, and you know there were all those funds were going broke. But what they're doing now is they're blaming the people who are collecting these pensions. They're blaming the workers, they're blaming the firemen, they're blaming the policemen. Whereas in reality, they were actually the victims of this fraud scheme. And the only reason that people aren't angrier about this, I think, is because they don't really understand what happened. If these were car companies that had sold a trillion dollars worth of defective cars uh, to the citizens of the United States, there would be riots right now. But these were mortgage-backed securities. It's complicated. People don't understand it. And they're only now, I think, beginning to realize that they were defrauded. Excellent. Well, the labor movement, I think, as a uh, semi-organized professional network of people who have at heart the interests of working-class people working inside their, their um, uh, workplaces is a lot uh, smaller than it's been probably for almost maybe almost a century and I think in its sort of organized capacity I think we have to kind of separate the labor movement from um, unions um, there's people who are part of one but not necessarily part of another I mean I think there's a lot of people who are part of unions who might even be surprised to find out they're in a union um, in the United States and I think that's probably true in other places too uh, so it's important to separate out the two different things. Um, but there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of people who know they're in unions and identify with it and think it's a good thing and are part of this amorphous thing called the labor movement. But uh, the labor movement in North America is, particularly in the United States, I think, is in a general state of either a crisis or a general state of uh, identity confusion right now and not really knowing what it is and where it needs to go in the future. And I think there's a lot of evidence for that. And I think it's been building over time, but we see even in the last five years uh, uh, really strong schisms emerge in the United States and, and the American labor movement, particularly with uh, the, the change to win coalition kind of uh, extrapolating itself from the AFL, uh, CIO, and ostensibly kind of going on its own to um, organize more in workplaces. Uh, and I think that's indicative of there being strong disagreements within labor unions and the labor movement more generally about strategy, about what to do. And some of the more ambitious organizing campaigns have been in, you know, with big corporations like, you know, for instance, Walmart, um, or 
one that's probably not that big yet, but hopefully will be in the future, maybe like Starbucks, for instance, finding ways of taking on these really symbolic behemoths of, you know, present-day capitalism that kind of signify where economies are headed and, you know, maybe where what we might already be, and finding ways of organizing them. Uh, I think that's kind of the future of the labor movement, but we're still kind of stuck in an old model, uh, an old way of thinking about labor. And we shouldn't kind of shed ourselves of that history or even shed ourselves of those labor unions. They're important and they need to be here. We started in 1996. Um, I'll just get into the fact that, uh, like most anarchist collectives, um, they either start pretty small or oftentimes they have some kind of benefactor that started that helps start them up. And we are no different in that regard. We got a uh, one of our first members uh, got a large inheritance when he was uh, uh, in his mid 20s and it kind of radicalized him, uh, or that didn't radicalize him, going down south in, in, uh, <laughs> in uh, the 80s in Central America did radicalize him. Um, but regardless, uh, he wanted to start something, or use his money towards uh, some good. So he purchased a building that we're gonna talk about later on that is called the Old Market Autonomous Zone. And then about a year later, uh, as a few other people started joining onto the collective, that's how, uh, that's when Mondragon started. Uh, there was a whole bunch of radical bookstores in Winnipeg that had closed down in the mid 90s. It was just really tough to, to actually run a, a radical bookstore in Winnipeg and survive. So these places were closing. We thought, well, why don't we throw a cafe in there. This is back when there weren't all those cafe and bookstores, uh, or I don't know if you guys have McNally's, or I'm sure you have chapters and all that crap, but uh, but when we uh, we started that, we figured, well, well it, to match our ethics, or to match what we're talking about politically, it should also be a vegetarian, or uh, which later became a vegan cafe. Uh, but the third idea, so we wanted a radical bookstore with anarchist literature, uh, and other literature, just radical uh, literature in general. Um, we wanted a vegetarian, uh, vegan coffee house that served like fair trade coffee and all, you know, ethical purchasing or as ethical as possible. And then the last part was, and this is kind of what we'll we'll talk a little bit about in the workshop is. We wanted our structure uh, to actually match sort of the vision of a world that we were seeking here and now. So. The co-op movement has been something in Winnipeg that's really, it's been a way for people to actually jump into activist work and actually be able to make a living and not have to uh, take on that crappy job somewhere else. If you structure as a worker co-op, you can't keep deferring people uh, ownership or equity in the, in the uh, and basically say it in the business. We've put it into our, to our articles that we have to run our business by um, consensus and then we also have to run our business by paying each person for effort and sacrifice. We don't pay people for how productive they are. So it doesn't matter if you're the most amazing sandwich maker in the world. Uh, you know, if Shannon can make 30 sandwiches in the time that I can make 10 doesn't mean that she gets paid three times more than me. Uh, and that's just a really important idea for us uh, to make sure that things are equal. You can take all of the tasks that need to happen in order to make your co-op work. And this, it's really important to actually do something like that, to understand, like to have checklists, to have uh, things that, like guidelines for people. If people come into a co-op and have no there's no uh, real structure there, Chance, and there's no training, chances are they're gonna be lost pretty quickly. As an anarchist, I see struggle taking place in a particular way. But one of the things that I believe in terms of solution based that we have to focus on is the, the question of labor self-management, which is how are we, while living in capitalism, going to engage in an economic practice that foreshadow the type of um, non-capitalist society of the future. For me, it's going to be an anarchist communist society, but just to say non-capitalist, we can bring more 
and the capitalists into the tent of where we're going, but we must look at labor self-management. I believe in building the road, the revolutionary path as we travel it. Because it makes no sense for us to say, okay, capitalist economic relations where a minority control, you know, the net income or the profit or the surplus from the large majority in society without taking positive action to challenge that. The problem is when we talk about um, labor owning capital within capitalism is that institutional environment, you know, the, you know, the setting of laws, um, the access to capital, all of those things, marketing your products are still controlled by the forces of capitalism. So we, if we look at the existing or even past worker corp movements, they've accommodated themselves to capitalism where you have a small group of workers love the fact that they control their work, they don't really have bosses as such, even though you know, they may have, especially the larger ones, they may have management structures that mirror those that exist, but at least they have the general, general assembly where they can set decisions whether we're gonna employ more workers or other, more members or we, we're gonna introduce technology so that we can engage in economic effic you know, efficiencies and compete better with capitalism. They can see, they make the decision, wage level and everything in, in terms of their um, general assembly. But we as socialists and anarchists and other leftists must look at how can we develop an economic practice that challenges capitalism while we're inside this thing. How are we gonna develop economic forms through whether it's all credit unions or are we taking over credit unions or creating credit unions to mobilize capital? Or are we gonna get access to the pension fund of the pension funds that exist out there where working class money are being used to finance capitalist businesses? How can we um, create these democratically controlled businesses that even though they're economic in form, are also part of our, uh, part of our politi political resistance um, strategy. And there's no question that where there is serious discussion today of new ways of organizing society, sustainability is always there. It's in so interesting that one of the new terms that's emerging in a lot of the grassroots movements, for example, in Bolivia today, where they've got the first indigenous president in the history of the country, the movement for socialism forms the government party, and so on, is eco-socialism. They're talking about a new variation of socialism where environmentalism and ecological sustainability is a core value, a fundamental building block of it. So I think you're right to highlight that. I don't see that it's helpful at all to sort of urge on the great collapse I think there's too much human suffering associated and too much environmental damage associated with that. I think it's much more important to begin to build actual alternatives that we can then point to. Here are the beginning ways of, of thinking about reorganizing society. I'm very um, influenced by the Zapatistas. Um, and one of the interesting things about the Zapatistas is they, is they haven't simply just called forward for an international solidarity movement to support them. Clearly that's happened. But one of the most significant things they've always said to people who come from away to provide support for them is that's important, but what we really need is for you to rebel where you are, in your own locations, right? Because your rebellions there will be the best material political assistance you can provide for us. So what I would encourage people to think about is Given where you're located, you know, what, are the, what are the most significant things that you could rebel around, that you could join together with other people? And I guess the other thing I want to say is I think the most effective forms of activism are ones that um, are informed by some of the principles of direct action. That is, you know, actually getting our bodies involved in the struggle, you know, defying unjust laws. Um, getting more actively involved in the struggle. Um, forms of direct action, forms of direct democracy, to me are absolutely crucial. Not sort of, I'm not dismissing writing letters, petitions, any of those things. Those can all be useful in all sorts of different contexts. But we can't change the world those ways. They may be useful as tactics to get more people involved and to, to get issues um, out there in the society more generally. But if we're actually talking about effective forms of activism, I think that's the most useful. Thing to think about is what is effective. Right. There will be no change in the West. There will be no change in the world. Right.
until a degree of violence with all due respect is embraced. Until people here in the West, in privileged places in the West, are willing and are able and go about and engage in the same sacrifices that the Zapatistas and Azalites in India are engaging in, there shall be no change. There is no social movement that is going to accomplish with all due respect, if we look at history, that will accomplish what we need to accomplish, i.e. a different world. We need to understand that if we're going to set marks high and if we're going to be honest and truthful about the world that we want to change, there is going to be a degree of violence. There is no pacifism without violence. And people who sit down and proclaim Gandhi as non-violence, well, you know, or MLK, or, you know, Nelson Mandela going underground. I don't think that, you know, civil rights movement could have even achieved a tenth or whatever it is that is achieved, and certainly they have not achieved whatever rights they have achieved because racism still exists, etc. Without the support of the Black Panther Party, without the Malcolm X movement, etc., etc. So for us to be so naive as to call about and say, well, we're going to engage in non-violent forms of resistance, well, yes, but we're confronted by a violent form of, of state power, capitalist power that is retaliating back, and do we really think that they're going to allow us to shape the world that we would like to shape? Um, alternatives to the world that is yet to come. Right? These alternatives exist on so many different levels, everything from community gardens to social centers, and they exist, and they're flourishing, and that's something that's wonderful. Right? We need to continue on along that front. We need to continue on with the nonviolent movement, as it is, and actually try and expand that. Right? But in terms of experience with regards to violence, at least among social activists in the West, there's hardly any experience whatsoever. There's this great fear, antagonism, etc., etc., and this great taboo with regards to it that needs some degree to be overcome. Because everything's finite, right? And I mean, ideally, I think we should be operating on every front imaginable. We should be trying to do reform. We should be trying to destroy the dominant order. We should be trying to build alternatives to it. That, you know, we should be working on, on solidarity amongst our own projects. Uh, we should be working on keeping ourselves relatively healthy as individuals. There's a lot to do. I think, honestly, postmodern capitalism is choking itself to death. And I try to take joy in that. It's increasingly out of fear bogging itself down. Um, <clears throat> You know, when that world ends, as that world ends, which I think it's doing right now, it's up to us to, to create other worlds within it. So The whole of U.S. and Canadian politics, the entirety of its politics, is built on this key idea of not letting the working class and oppressed people know that they have the power to run society. That's what it's all about. And one big break in that, a general strike in one city, for example, a successful mass movement, the mass, mass struggle in any place in North America could break through that illusion that people have. See, I gotta draw a line, I can't take it no more If you ain't down with revolution, what you waiting for? Making money for suckers and not communities poor Ripping flags off of coffins, man, this ain't our war Colonizing and terrorized by the world's biggest killers The U.S. government, the biggest weapon and drug dealers Filling prisons with children, incarcerating the future My space and Facebook got us stuck on computers Stuck on stupid bumping music that's abusive to the shorties And the nonsense that you're spitting, they just listening, absorbing I've been dormant, I've been working, I'm a giant, I'm ready I'm with the Apple in Oaxaca and we hold the machetes I rock hard like Palestinian children holding slingshots I'm with every single kid that's down for hip-hop For the culture, the life, what it really stands for This music is resistance, it's the voice of the poor I'm on the side of the workers, the teachers, and lunch ladies On the streets with brown mommies, raising our brown babies I'm with youth organizers, cleaning up the Bronx River I'm like Jaime Escalante when I stand and deliver I'm with Evo Morales, man, he run in Bolivia Distribution of the land so we can all live bigger I'm with Hugo and Fidel, Grandmaster and Melly Mel I'm with the Panthers up in Queens, justice for Sean Bell I'm with Camacho Negron, I'm with Ojeda Rios Freedom for Oscar Lopez, it's time to get in the bill I'm with a blue Jamal, I'm with a side of Shakur I'm with the compas in the mall, can he get in a penny more?
Tomorrow. Stop, 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 stop